of St. Benedict. This feast is peculiar to us Benedictines in the Benedictine tradition because it's celebrating the death of St. Benedict. The Universal Church celebrates July 11th with Benedict as a patron of Europe. But we also get to celebrate St. Benedict usually on March 21st, but since yesterday was the fifth Sunday of Lent, 
of course, the Lenten Sundays supersede Benedict. What an amazing person to think that the way that he taught and lived is the way, the values that we live today. We just listened to the hymn that is sung at the first Magnificat. And it says, shout all you people, let your me measured praises ring through the churches solemnly and sweetly. On this is feast day, Benedict ascended heaven's high summit. He foretold the day of his death. It was about six days before he died. He had the grave opened. His sister Scholastica had died shortly before that. And then he got a fever and he was very sick and he died, hands raised to heaven, supported by his brother monks. So he's very much the patron of a happy death. He, when his youthful joyous years were blooming, yet in his boyhood, left his native dwelling, seeking concealment, hid within a cavern, lonely and silent. He had gone off to Rome. Rome was probably just like our very modern liberal schools and very modern liberal thoughts. And he was so turned off by that that he felt this call to give his life to God. And so he went out and lived in a cavern for three years. He received a habit from the monk Romanus. Romanus sometimes brought him food, probably gave him some spiritual direction. But the amazing thing is that after three years of living in a, in a cave, in a cave that the local peasants and farmers came to know about him. They were so touched by what he had to say about who we are, where we're going, that God loves us, that it makes a difference how we live. And, you know, that's a pretty amazing. Having grown up as a farmer's daughter, it's pretty hard to tell me that this dropout from college would have had something to say to me, yet alone about the spiritual life. There amid nettles, rigid thorns and briars, won he the battle over youth's enticement, nurse of pollution, then he wrote a holy rule of blessed living. That certainly condenses his life. It wasn't that quick. Yes, he had to battle the temptations of the flesh. And yes, he wrote a rule, but there was a long time in between. Thy brazen image, infamous Apollo, soon hath he smitten, burnt the grove of Venus, then to the baptism on the sacred mountain established a chapel. So he moved from Subiaco where he lived as a hermit and where he had done his first uh, kind of like experiments as being abbot. And Monte Cassino was on a major route from uh, Rome uh, down to down south. And so it was up, I mean it's really on the top of a mountain. It is a mountain. And there on the mountain there was a, sh a shrine yet to Apollo. Apollo was the god of war and of many other things. And so it's a wonder that he didn't experience even more opposition than he did, but he went up, he knocked over this statue to Apollo. He wiped out the groves of Venus of this immoral worship, and he claimed it for Christ. And he dedicated the, the what was the temple to Saint Martin of Tours, who was the monk bishop in France. And he held him in such great esteem, and therefore he, he did that. So he built the monastery there, probably beginning in, in 529. And then he began to write out his reflections, his way of making the gospel practical, concrete. I was thinking today that now having been blessed to live this monastic life for a long time, that the goal of Benedict's life is that we see everything through the eyes of faith, through the heart of faith, through the eyes of Christ. And even though in some of the antiphons that we sang this morning at, at Lodz and at Turs, it talked about, you know, he lived an angelic life. In some ways, I think that's a little bit misleading. He had his feet very much on the earth. He said to treat the tools of the monastery as sacred vessels. He said to welcome guests as Christ. He lined out what to pray of the Psalms, 
when I think that we pray the same Te Deum, we pray the same basic structures of the Psalms, we live the same basic pattern of the life as what he did 1,500 years, and he changed the world. Now doth he witness happily in heaven seraphim leading throngs of shining angels while he refreshes faithful hearts who need him with living waters. Certainly, our culture is very much like it was. We need his leading waters. We need to have a way of having the gospel practical in our life to form our thoughts, our words, to form our actions, to form our interactions. Then praise to the Father, to the Soul Begotten, Seraph, uh, and, and to Thee, always with the twain co-equal, fostering spirit, one and only Godhead, through all the ages. Amen. So we ask St. Benedict's intercession. He, by changing his own life, and, and other people came to know him, other people were so drawn by his goodness that they too wanted instruction, about how to follow Christ, how to prefer Christ above all things. And Benedict has shown us that. And Benedict wrote this rule, this commentary on the gospel, this application on the gospel. And he tries to give us the lens of faith, as I said, the lens of faith that give us this new appreciation how God is present in our daily life, how God loves us in our daily life, and how we can respond to God's love. Happy Feast of St. Benedict.